So I want to begin by telling you that a teacher gave her class a lesson on magnets. And uh, the very next day, she began to talk to her second grade class. And she said to her class, now, my name has six letters. The first letter is M. And I pick up things. What am I? A little boy raised his hand and said, you're a mother. <laughs> so true. Another little boy and uh, his sister saved up their own money to buy their mom on Mother's Day some flowers. And so they went to the florist, actually pulled all their pennies, quarters, nickels, dimes together, and they bought their mom a floral arrangement. And uh, they presented it to their mom and had a big ribbon wrapped around it. And on the ribbon, it said, rest in peace. And they, they explained to their mom, it's the most perfect Mother's Day flower, uh, flower arrangement because you're always saying you need some quiet and some rest. Now you can rest in peace. <laughs> Listen, you and I both know that it's mothers who genuinely, uh, for all of our lives, we recognize that uh, mothers carry the heavy load and they are the center of the home. Everyone recognizes it. It's the dad who takes their son to practice and to the ball games and raises their sons up to be uh, men. And uh, when that little boy becomes a star big leaguer um, and gets interviewed, who does he acknowledge? Hi, Mom. Yeah. So today I want to pull some mom truths out of a story in First uh, Samuel chapter 1. And this chapter is the story of a mother and her child, and it teaches us the value of the mother among many other things. So the backdrop is this. Elkanah had two wives. His wife's name were Peninnah and Hannah. Now we're going to call Peninnah in this story Penny for short. So Penny and Hannah were Elkanah's two wives. And we begin reading in verse 1 about Elkanah, who was the son of Jeroham. And in verse 2, <clears throat> the Bible says that he had two wives, Penny and Hannah. Penny had children with her husband. Hannah had none. And in verse 3, it says, year after year, <clears throat> their husband and his family would um, go from their town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord, the Jewish feasts. And then we read in verse 4 that whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, to go to these feasts and, and to take all of his family, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penny, and to her sons and daughters, their children. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. Remember, she didn't have any kids. Because he loved her, but her womb was closed. Then we find out in verse 6 <clears throat> that because Hannah's womb was closed, her rival, Penny, kept provoking her to irritate her. Now, <clears throat> why did Penny irritate Hannah? Because she recognized her husband really loved Hannah. And so verse 7 tells us that this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and wouldn't eat. So she became, Hannah did, an emotional wreck. Have you realized these two wives were not good sister wives? Not that anyone is. <clears throat> One time, um, I don't know when it was, um, Joyce walked into the family room and, and uh, I had something very dangerous in my hands. Uh, I had the uh, remote control <laughs> and I was sitting there transfixed watching a television show called Sister Wives. <laughs> and... She comes in and she watches for a moment. And then she says to me, what in the world are you watching? 
I said, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. And she said, Tom Villalobos, turn that off right now. Well, Hannah and Penny were not good sister wives. One was jealous, irritated, and Hannah became an emotional wreck over it. And in verse 8, the Bible says that uh, she became so downhearted by this relationship. And what that tells us is that Hannah began to become a little depressed. She was depressed about the fact that she couldn't have kids. She was de de depressed about the fact that uh, the other wife could and that she was made fun of and, and it became an irritant in her life. And so there was just a, a bit of, of depression that began to, to creep up on her. Listen, people in the Bible that we admire, they're just people. And they have issues and problems just like you and I do. Just because they are in the stories that we read, it doesn't mean that they are perfect. They aren't perfect Bible characters, and you aren't a perfect Christian character. We all are subject to things in our lives, and, and sometimes your growth will stop. Sometimes your growth will go. But we're human beings, and we all experience things like Hannah did. Hannah experienced a touch of depression, and it got me to thinking about, especially as I read this chapter, how we as Christians should respond to being disheartened about things. How we as Christians should respond to when a little bit of depression touches our lives. Because we aren't perfect, and we do experience these various things. So uh, just as I begin to read through this chapter, I, I saw a way out of depression. So if you're experiencing a touch of depression, if you're experiencing just a little bit of being disheartened about your life and where things are at in your life, Hannah's going to teach us a lesson in her life how to deal with it. And we find, first of all, in verse 8 of this chapter, we read, her husband said, Hannah, why are you crying? Why are you not eating? Why are you downhearted? Why are you depressed? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? And, and this is the first thing that I saw to deal with depression and being downhearted and discouraged. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. If you want to stay in depression, then you just keep thinking about all the things that are going wrong. You keep thinking about all the things that you're feeling that cause you to be disheartened. And you keep thinking and dwelling upon the depression you feel because of what you're not experiencing that you think you should be. Her husband, Hannah's husband, said this, Hannah, Think about me and how much I love you rather than what you don't have. Secondly, verse 9, we read, Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Don't stop. This is the second point to deal with depression and dis disheartened behavior. Don't stop natural routines. When depression hits you, when, when you're discouraged and disheartened, uh, eat, drink, sleep, but don't stay in bed. Get up. Hannah stood up. Don't isolate yourself. Push yourself to do the things that are normal and natural that lend itself to being healthy and whole, physically and mentally. And then we read the next thing that she did in, in verse 9. She, it, go back to verse 9. It says, she went to the house of the Lord. She went to church. When you're depressed and when you're down and you're discouraged, you need to be around people who are going to encourage you. People are going to smile at you. People are going are to say, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Well, 
what can I help you? Let me pray with you. You need to be around people who will move you and, and shake you up. I'll tell you what, when, I, when I'm feeling like, like I, I'm just kind of I'm beat up a little bit, I just can't wait to get to the house of the Lord because I know I'm going to find people who are going to look at me and going to smile. Now, I may find people who may not smile at me, but I know I'm going to find more people who are going to look at me and greet me and smile at me. And I'll tell you what, that's an encouragement to me. It's a big encouragement. So um, go to church. Go to God's house. Be around people who speak life into you, who will encourage you. And then in verse 10, we read the next thing she did to deal with her disheartened state, her, her depressed state. It says, in her deep anguish, in her depression, Hannah prayed to the Lord. She began to pray. Oh, never, 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 ever, 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 ever belittle or make light or small the power of prayer. Oh, we got to be people of prayer. We've got to kick it in high gear where prayer is concerned. In your life, if, you, if things aren't where you want them to be, the first step for you is to begin to pray and call upon the name of the Lord. And that's what Hannah did. Out of her pain, she prayed. Oftentimes, out of our pain, we don't want anything to do with, with spiritual things because we're depressed. But out of her pain, she prayed. And then in verse 11, the Bible said, and she made a vow. She made a vow. The word vow in Hebrew, nadar, means a promise. Actually means speaking a promise. She began to confess what she believed in her heart. Things are going to get better. And, and her vow was this. Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, I'll give him to the Lord all the days of my life. That's my confession. That's my vow. That's what I'm speaking because I'm able to speak vow and confess because I've been in your presence. I've been praying. And I'm going to make this vow to you. No razor will ever be used on his head. Now, what in the world has got, that got to do with prayer? Well, that was actually um, a covenant that was made uh, where the male child, when they were offered to the Lord from the age of 20 to about 50, they were to not shave their heads but let their hair grow long. Um, I think I quoted the scripture to my dad when back in the late 60s and early 70s, he wanted me to get a haircut because I used to have hair down to here. Actually, I just used to have hair. That was nice. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, this scripture verse didn't move him at all. And uh, I got a haircut. But, but from the age of 20 to about 50, the males, in, in, in offering their service to the Lord, uh, would let their hair grow. And, but look what the vow of, of Hannah is if she were to have a son. He's going to serve you all the days of his life. And a razor's not going to touch his head till the day he dies. I mean, that's a vow. That's a confession. That's saying, I'm, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord completely and entirely. She's able to do that because of her prayer life. And then we read in verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord... As she kept on praying, to, don't stop praying. I don't know what you're going through and what you're experiencing. I don't know how difficult your circumstances are. Don't stop praying. Your help is the Lord. Your help comes from the Lord. There's, there's no help apart from him. Oh, kick it, kick it in high gear. As she kept on praying to the Lord. Never stop praying for your children, moms. Never stop praying for your grandchildren, grandmothers. Never stop praying. Hannah didn't. You know, when my mother passed, my dad had passed a few years before. And, and when my dad passed, we, you know, pretty much left everything uh, as it was, all the things that they had together in their home. And my mom lived in their home for a few more years before she passed. And, but once they were both gone, we, you know, as children, the six of us, we had to 
deal with all of that stuff in a garage full of boxes and boxes of papers and pictures and, of course, a house full of furniture and all of their personal effects. And so we, we had to deal with all of that stuff. And me living up here, uh, uh, my parents lived in Escondido. My family lived down there. I wasn't really involved a whole lot in, in going through all that stuff. We spent a few days down there doing that, but, uh, and then it being dispersed. And um, I kidded my, my uh, siblings that, um, you know, they got all the good stuff. I, I didn't get anything since I wasn't down there. Of course, the truth is I didn't have any room for more stuff. Uh, uh, but um, I, the, the one thing I got, I wouldn't trade for anything else. Uh, I got her prayer journals, my mom's prayer journals. And as I began to read through her prayer journals, I was just amazed. Through the years, I mean, these are over years and years and years and years of praying for her six children. And her last prayer journal had more of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren than it did her children. But as I began to read through those prayer journals... Boy, I saw the commitment she made to praying for each of us. And I, I, I would find page after page of her journaling about what she was praying for me. And I thought, wow, I didn't realize, you know, I needed that much prayer. <laughs> if any of my siblings are watching this morning, boy, I have stories to tell about what she was praying over you. I was an angel compared to some of you. <laughs> but those prayer journals tell the story of my mom continually, without ceasing, praying for her children. And all six of her children are serving God and are serving in churches. Her grandchildren are serving God and her great grandchildren. Uh, I, it's, it's amazing to me that it all came as a result of prayer. I've never stopped mothers praying. And then in, in uh, verse 17, the priest says, all right, Hannah, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked them. Remember the context. She is upset, she's depressed, she's distressed, she has no children, so she goes to prayer. And we read all the things that she needed to do to make sure she dealt with the depression so that she could receive the promise. And Eli said, after all of her continual prayer, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And that really uh, got me to thinking about, about peace uh, because often moms have more opportunity than anyone else to not be at peace. How many of you gave your mom fits? Come on. Amen. Now, some of them were sinful fits, and some of them were just kid, child fits, but they were fits nonetheless. Listen, peace is something that every mother must work on and I know that sounds funny because you would think peace just serenity ought to just come and but it has to be worked on um, and so I want to just quickly share with you the in, that I wrote down five works of peace number one it's it's minds and thoughts Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 if you want to be at peace the Lord will keep in perfect peace all who trust in him all whose thoughts are fixed on the Lord. If you want to be at peace in your life, then you've got to change your stinking thinking, and you've got to have a mind that, fi that is fixed on the Lord, not the problem. Same thing that Hannah was told by her husband. Then, number two, you've got to fight off anxiety. Listen, anxiety comes to everyone. Anxiety comes to everyone. Anxiety comes to your pastor. And I got to deal with it. I got to fight it off. John chapter 14, verse 27 says, As peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled. 
Another translation says, anxious. And don't be afraid. Fight off anxiety. And I, I, I have to do it in my life. And you've got to do it in yours. Number three, keep a spirit of gratitude always. Again, we see this in, in Hannah's life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace. Always be thankful. Always have a spirit of gratitude if you want peace. Number four, seek and pursue peace. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. How many of your husband, you husbands and wives in here have had to seek peace and then pursue it where your relationship with your spouse is concerned? Because sometimes we, you know, we, we depart from a peaceful relationship. What does the Bible say? Seek peace and pursue it. Yesterday's a prime example. <laughs> and I'm not talking about Modesto and Joshua Tree. Uh, at our house, um, uh, we, we, are, we are babysitting my son Drew's white German shepherd. Oh. The dog just irritates me. <laughs> we have a very calm, loving, golden retriever. But this white German shepherd, um, Drew and Emily spoiled this dog. He, 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 huge dog, and he slept indoors his whole life. Well, I'm, she's not sleeping indoors in my house. <laughs> he's, out, he's outdoors. I kicked him out. And every night, he has destroyed two wooden outdoor doors to my yard by scratching on them, trying to, with his big, huge, big foot claws, trying to get in. And, and if you open the gate, he's gone. And so yesterday, and he's, he's done that. And, and I, I just, every time he, the gate gets opened, by me, he doesn't get out, but for some reason, when Joyce opens the gate, he's gone. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And so yesterday, she opens the gate, and he's gone. He runs down the hill, and he goes down the street. He's gone. And I hear Joyce yelling, Jack, 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 come back, Jack. And I'm My peace is now disturbed. <laughs> and so I, I run outside. She's walking down our long hill, our driveway. Jack, Jack. And I, and I come down, and now I'm, I, 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 I was not a good husband. And I said, I can't believe you did that. How hard is it to keep the... I got to go find that dog. How hard is it to just squeeze through the gate and close it. And she didn't like that. <laughs> and so, and I said, and, and, and so she's whistling. And here's how, she, well, I'll tell you the rest of that story in a minute, but so I get to the top of that hill and I start whistling. And as soon as I do, he's down the street, he, he comes back and he runs back up. And I said, get in the backyard. And he did, and I shut the gate. And now she's mad. She's unhappy because I said, how did you let that dog get out? And so she's unhappy because of the tone of my voice. And so I thought about my message today. <laughs> you got to seek and pursue peace. And so as we're walking back up the hill, she's not happy. And I'm, and I'm walking up. And I walk up next to her, and I started to laugh, and I said, you can't whistle, can you? She was at the top of the hill going, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and she 
started to laugh and then, real, and then remembered she was not happy. And so she stopped laughing. Um, but you know what? I did what the Bible says. You got to seek and pursue peace. So I made light of it. And she knew it. And she looked at me with a little bit of a tiny smile. And she says, I know what you're doing. <clears throat> Last one, number five. Mercy and love. Jude, verse two says this, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. If you want peace, you want to move away from all the things that are keeping you under uh, for yourself and for others, you've got to propel your peace with love and with, with mercy. Be, be merciful and loving to yourself and to those around you. All right, let's finish this up. Um, look at... <clears throat> uh, Verse, verse 17, the priest said, so go in peace. And then in verse 18, we read, <clears throat> she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went her way, she ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. The depression lifted. And in verse 20, the depression is now gone. She's at peace. She's done the things necessary to rid herself of anxiety and depression. She's, she's praying. Now, in verse 20, the Bible says she became pregnant. She gives birth to a son, Samuel. And how does she raise him? Look at verse 21. <clears throat> when her husband, Elkanah, went up with all of his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow. Verse, uh, let's go to the next verse. verse um, I'll go back to verse 21. Verse 21 says that... Um, Hannah did not go. That's not what it says here, but it says it somewhere. <clears throat> but Hannah did not go. She didn't go on the family pilgrimage. Why? She chose to stay home with her child. Recognize, I, I recognize that today, most families have to have two incomes. It's a sign of the times. Both families work. I recognize that. And so this is not a guilt trip for that. You can still give time for your child. That is adequate. Uh, in our early years of ministry, we chose for Joyce to quit her job to raise our children at home every day, even though she was making much more money than I was on her job. And so um, she stayed home and raised the kids, and we were poor. We were poor. How poor were we? <laughs> We were so poor, our Christmas tree uh, was a pine cone on the end of a stick. I mean, that's how poor we were. <laughs> this is when my monologue kicks in, okay? We were so poor, our garage sale consisted of Joyce and I sitting in the front yard in lawn chairs. We were so poor, we couldn't afford the free samples at Costco. That's how poor we were. I ran another one by Joyce, but she said, no, you can't say that one. <laughs> I said, why not? She said, because it's, it's a little too edgy. It's, it's just not proper on Mother's Day. Anybody want to hear it? <laughs> Joyce? <laughs> we were so poor. We were so poor that we, we went to Kentucky Fried Chicken to lick other people's fingers. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's bad. <laughs> I take responsibility for that. I, have you ever noticed, those of you who are getting older, how your filter just starts to leave you? Oh, man. Okay. It's Mother's Day. We're having fun. Verse 23. Let's finish this up. Verse 23. So... <clears throat> Uh, Hannah stayed home. There it is. With Samuel. How I many of you know home to a child is gold? They may want to go and do, but home to them is gold. Verse 24. And as he grew older, mom, Hannah, s took him to church. She brought him to the house of the Lord. She didn't send him. She brought him. And we read in verse 28 
that she gave. Now, I give him to the Lord for his whole life. Because remember the vow she made? For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. In those days, they would send their children uh, as part of, of, of their upbringing to the house of the Lord and leave them there. Please don't bring your children and leave them here at church. But um, <clears throat> they, would, they would do that. And he worshiped the Lord there. She dedicated him to serve God for his whole life. Can we do that? After all, everyone has a free will. Let me just give you some hope. Those of you whose children and grandchildren are not serving the Lord, Proverbs 22, verse 6 <coughs> says this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, another verse, an, another translation of that, the NLT, says direct your children onto the right path, and when they're older, they will not leave it. What if you didn't start them off on the right path? Like Hannah did Samuel. Are they doomed to hell? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 in the NIV says this, this day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Listen to this scripture from Douay Reem's Bible. Uh, I'm just going to read it to you. It says this, hand in hand, the evil man shall not be innocent, but the seed of the just shall be saved. And this lines up with scripture throughout the Bible. I found over 50 scriptures that had the same theme. I'm going to read you two of them, and then we're going to close. Jeremiah 31, verses 16 through 17. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping. Stop crying. Stop crying. Your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. Quit crying over your child who's living for the devil. Quit crying for your grandchild who's not serving the Lord. Your work on your knees will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. <laughs> Verse 17, so there is hope for your children, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own lands. This speaks of Israel and it speaks of our children in, in this hour that we live. Isaiah 59, verse 21 in the good, in God's word translation. It says, this is my promise to them, says the Lord, my spirit who is on you, my words that I put in your mouth will not leave you. They'll be with your children and your grandchildren permanently. Permanently, says the Lord. They may wander, they may stray, but what I am doing will be permanent. What they're doing right now, serving the devil, it's temporary. What I have done is permanent in Jesus' name. Listen, every great move of God has its beginnings in a mother's space of prayer for her children. Sarah and Isaac, Rebecca and Jacob, Elizabeth and John the Baptist. But of course, all of that leads to Mary and Jesus. The books of 1 and 2 Samuel, from which we have read today, tells the story of how God turned Israel into a kingdom and how he would find a man. If you would read on in 2 Samuel, he would find a man, David, after his own heart, who would sit on the throne, the royal throne. And that royal line would begin with, with David and would run all the way to Jesus. But it all began with the praying mom, Hannah, for her son, Samuel. Father, my prayer today is that the blessing of God would be upon every mother, that they will not lose heart, they will not stay in depression and in and out of peace for what they see and are experiencing in their children's lives. But Lord, encourage them today to know the promises of God are yes and amen. Their children will return. Their children will serve you. That which you have spoken is permanent, not temporary. Father, the word of the Lord is that the children of this house, 
the young people of this house are going to serve you in ways even that, that we who are older generationally did not. And they're going to do more than we ever did. And we're going to continue to pray for children and our young people, our young adults, for the time of God is at hand. So Lord, may this word be an encouragement to every mother. In Christ Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, listen, it's not a fairy tale. It's it, it, the story of Jesus. He was a real person sent from heaven. He walked on the earth. It can be proved. As I said a few weeks ago, so, so many people who actually live their, their life on this earth is documented, not only in the Bible, but in history books, saw Jesus on the earth after the resurrection. And the resurrection, him coming out of the tomb is what made this moment possible for you and for me to receive the Son of the living God as Lord and Savior. Quit running. Quit hiding. Quit trying to figure out another way. The sooner you recognize and realize that the darkness of this world is getting ready to consume the world in which we live, Politicians don't have the answer. Political parties don't have the answer. Governments, social programs, there's no answer to be found in them. And while most may have good intentions, they see the answer is do it my way. And in the middle of all that chaos, the Lord says, there's a way that seems right in, to a man, but it'll always end up in destruction. Today, serve the Lord. Today, decide who you will serve. And God's answer will begin to unfold for your life. There'll never be perfection on this earth, but you'll be able to follow a path that'll keep you in perfect peace. You'll be able to follow a path that will remove the stain and covering of anxiety, fear, depression. And you'll be able to do as Hannah did, pray the answer into your life. That comes with serving God. If you're here, if you're watching and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and you want me to pray with you today, if you're away from God, you served him before, you're not serving him today, you want me to pray with you today. Quickly, right now, lift your hand, wave it at me. Say, Pastor, it's me. Would you pray for me? I need Jesus. Wave it at me. Anybody, this service, pray for me. I need Jesus. I need the Lord. I need to get right with God. I'm away from him. You're at home watching. I need Christ. I need Jesus. Anyone at all. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, forgiving me, being the Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross, rose again, and today come to live in my life as Lord and Savior. And from this day on, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.